Okay, it's 10 o'clock and let's get started. Hello everybody, I'm Asan Gazvinian and I'm a geomechanics engineer at Itasca Consulting Group. Uh, thanks for joining the IMAS webinar today. Uh, for those of you who are not really familiar with IMAS, it stands for Itasca Constitutive Model for Advanced Strain Softening. And I'm excited to share with you some of the theoretical background, some of the components and features of this uh, constitutive model with you throughout the webinar today. So, um, there you go. So this is the agenda for the webinar today. I first give a quick intro on the strain softening constitutive models, the overall framework of strain softening constitutive models. Then I'll dive into the theory behind IMAS and some of the components. And along the way, I'll try to show you some of the applied examples using those individual components for real, uh, real world examples. And finally, we will have a questions and answer session. So I encourage you to post your questions throughout the webinar uh, or even at the end through this box that I'm showing here. And we'll try to get through all of those at the very end at the Q&A session. And my colleague, uh, Zhao Cheng, will also be available. He's uh, our Flag 3D product manager, and he's also in charge of implementation of the constitutive models within our codes. So if you have any questions with regards to the details of implementation of IMAS within FLAG 3D or 3D, you would be glad to answer those questions. Okay, let's talk about uh, some general uh, components to strain softening constitutive models. When we use a numerical model to represent the damage around an excavation, a slope, or even a caving process, this model should account for the progressive failure and this integration of the rock mass from an initial intact or jointed condition to a bulk, uh, bulk state. And the extent that the rock mass would bulk really depends on the application that we are using the constitutive model for. For instance, uh, if you simulate a caving process, when the rock mass becomes part of the mud pile, it's going to get to a fully bulk state. But the level of this bulking is going to be drastically less for slopes or even underground excavations. And through this process, there are four critical factors that control the overall behavior of the rock mass. First and foremost is the reduction in strength of the rock mass as, as the rock mass deforms. And we know that as massive to moderately jointed rock masses deform, they weaken basically by fracturing. And this fracturing is associated with loss of cohesion and tensile strength. But the same rock mass, if it's even slightly confined, it can it can uh, gain strength again uh, due to a combination of friction mobilization and dilation that's resulting from bulking. The next critical factor is the post peak brittleness, which is basically the rate at which the strength would drop from its peak value to a residual value as, as a loaded rock mass accumulated plastic deformation. And basically, this uh, brittleness controls how fast or slow uh, the rock mass, the yielded rock mass, would shed stress away. The next factor is the modulus softening. And, and, as, and we know that as the rock mass falls, it undergoes a reduction in modulus. And representing this uh, reduction in modulus is crucial for assessing the evolving stress state around, around an underground opening or around the cave or around the slope. And finally, the dilational behavior that if we have a proper representation of dilation, dilational behavior for our rock mass, we can have a reliable estimate of uh, volume increase as the rock mass accumulates plastic uh, deformation. And this is going to impact the confinement dependent strength of the rock mass for us in the numerical model. This entire process of loading the rock mass to a peak value followed by a post peak reduction in strength to some residual value as the rock mass accumulates strain is called a strain softening process. And numerically, we tend to replicate this behavior using some strain-dependent material properties, such as cohesion or friction angle or rock mass modulus or dilation angle that changes as the, as the material accumulates strength. All right, now let's see how IMAS would fit within this framework of strain softening constitutive models. IMAS, uh, just a bit of a background, IMAS is a successor to the original CAFO constitutive model that we started using it within, within uh, its, its formal uh, name of CAFO 
around 2010. And CaveHook was, as you can tell from the name of it, was initially developed for simulation of cave mining. And CaveHook, uh, uh, in terms of strength, was characterized by two bounding yield surfaces, one a peak strength envelope and another one uh, a residual strength envelope, similar to any other constitutive model that's available for within, within our uh, codes. And the residual strength of CaveHook was uh, typically said to represent both rock fill material with angular fragments. This would basically give the zero cohesion and a friction angle of around 40 to 45 degrees characteristics to that residual strength. And, and because of uh, the powerful features and the ability of CaveHook to closely mimic the behavior of rock mass under complex stress paths, over time, uh, CaveHook became the default constitutive model for mining applications at Itasca. And after many successful projects and, and new discoveries about greater rock behavior, IMAS was developed and based on all the learnings that we gone through with CaveHook. And the main difference between IMAS and CaveHook is that IMAS is defined by two residual yield surfaces versus one that CaveHook had. So these two residual sur surfaces uh, we call the first one post peak envelope, and that's what I'm going to refer to throughout this webinar. And the second envelope is called ultimate strength envelope, or the true residual strength of the rock mass. In iron mass, softening is captured in two phases, basically between peak strength to post peak strength, and then between post peak strength and ultimate strength. For this discussion, let's assume we have two uh, different rock masses. And for simplicity, let's assume that they have the same intact rock strength, but they have different structural integrity. Let's assume one of them has lower GSI and the other one has a higher GSI. As we load up the, this rock mass, or if the rock mass deforms, we are introducing microfractures within the intact rock. And these microfractures start to propagate and coalesce and basically uh, isolate individual blocks and form individual blocks uh, within the intact rock. So, between peak strength to post peak strength, you're damaging the rock due to fracturing of the intact rock. And this is commonly or typically associated with very small or negligible bulking. Therefore, uh, it's more of a small strain process. And numerically, this damage is assessed uh, using accumulation of plastic shear strain in the model. As we introduce more porosity to the rock mass by rearranging these isolated blocks as they start to move and rotate and rearrange around each other, we introduce bulking to the rock mass and disturb the rock mass. And this is associated with significant increase in bulking and therefore a larger strain process. And to represent this larger strain process within the numerical model, we assess this disturbance using the volumetric strain within the numerical model. You will hear this volumetric strain or volumetric strain increment or VSI throughout this webinar a lot. But what that means in terms of uh, real rock mass behaviors is exactly equivalent to bulking for us. So now let's look at the stress strain behavior of these two different rock masses. So if we only had two uh, strength envelopes, one for the peak and one for the residual strength, we would capture the peak strength of the rock masses correctly and the ultimate strength of the rock masses correctly but we would miss what's happening in the middle at point two, which is at post peak strength. And that's a very critical part of rock mass behavior because mechanisms like cohesion weakening and frictional strengthening uh, would, would occur at that point. And, and one would, might say that, okay, I would set my residual strength to be equal to point two to capture that physics, which is fair, but then you would miss the um, frictional degradation of the rock mass as we move from post peak to ultimate strength to a true residual strength state of the rock mass. So from that, that discussion, we can put this conceptual stress strain curve together that's implemented in IMAS that the rock mass is deformed up to its peak strength. And then there, we introduce damage to the, uh, to the rock mass and it moves from peak to post peak strength due to this damage as it accumulates plastic shear strain, and, add, and then we disturb the rock mass between post peak to an ultimate strength as we introduce porosity or bulking to the rock mass. 
Now, if you put that stress strain curve back into the principal stress uh, plot, we come back, we get back to these three stress envelopes that we discussed earlier, and it shows how different a different uh, part of softening or weakening of this uh, model is controlled either by plastic shear strain initially and then by volumetric by accumulation of volumetric strain increment. All right, now that uh, we know that it's 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 justified and it's actually more reliable to have three strand envelopes uh, with two residuals representing our rock mass behavior, the million dollar question is that how do we define the properties of these strand envelopes? Um, within IMAS, the characteristics of or the, uh, the parameters of the peak strand envelope by default is calculated using the classical hook ram criterion. So if you plug in the GSI, the MI value, and the intact ECS, it would calculate the MSNA parameters for us. But we also recognize the fact that sometimes GSI is not applicable for a rock mass. Uh, and in that case, the user is allowed to uh, input directly the MSNA that they came up with uh, through rock mass characterization practice. For the for estimation of the characteristics of the residual envelopes, what we use is that we fit the hook ground parameters of the residual strength envelopes uh, to approximate Barton's shear strength uh, criteria for rock field material, which is prescribed using this equation here. In this equation, R is the equivalent roughness that I'm going to get to it in a bit. Uh, S is the intact rock strength of each fragment and Phi B is the basic friction angle between the rock fragments. So basically what this shear strength criteria would give us is that it gives us the degradation of the shear strength as we introduce porosity to the rock mass as an move from post-peak envelope to ultimate strength envelope. And as you can see, this is the nomogram that is used that's suggested by Barton to estimate the equivalent roughness or R. And as you can see, this R in the equation is what uh, is used as a token for uh, change in porosity. So this R is determined as a function of porosity and also the angularity, the, the roundedness or smoothness of each individual rock fragments. So, and because we are, uh, we, we, we need to have an, uh, a correlation between this R to our uh, residual strength envelopes to be able to uh, approximate hook ground strength parameters to match different states of porosity in this equation. So at post peak strength, we are assuming that the rock mass have undergone fracturing, but the bulk, but the resulting rock fragments are still fully interlocked. And therefore we assume zero porosity uh, for the rock mass at post peak strength envelope. Uh, so as you can see in this in this nomogram, it starts from 15% porosity. So for 0% porosity, we needed to extrapolate uh, the chart. And basically what we assume is that we start with an equivalent roughness of around like 14 or 15 for the rock mass. And for the ultimate strength envelope, uh, that is the true rock mass residual strength. And this point, uh, we assume that the rock mass have uh, undergone complete uh, bulking and the, and the resulting rock fragments interlocking is at its minimum. And based on our experience uh, doing simulation for mainly caving operations, we think the maximum porosity of 40%, although the chart goes all the way to 45%, we think the 40% porosity is a reasonable cutoff that the rock mass can eventually bulk up to. So basically, just to sum up, we are moving from 0% porosity to 40% porosity, and we evaluate R, and that's going to give us the degradation of shear strength uh, for the material, and then we will convert that to hook ground properties. So ideally, the first and second residual envelopes describe the behavior of cohesionless, perfectly frictional material with different degrees of interlocking. Okay. So when the shear strength from Barton equation is converted to a strength envelope in sigma one, sigma three space, it can be, it can be approximated by hook round envelopes uh, that, that have the following parameters. First of all, we set the S parameter, the parameter of the hook round envelope to zero because we want to force the cohesion for these two uh, envelopes to, do, to be zero at, at uh, 
at uh, zero confinement. Remember, we, we assume that these two envelopes are cohesionless, perfectly frictional material. The A parameter in the hook brown equation is basically what uh, has the component of porosity in it and is the only parameter that evolves as we move from post peak envelope to the ultimate, uh, ultimate strength envelope. You can see that there is a porosity max in here, the, it changes as the porosity increases. And you also have the component of RI that we call it the roundedness index as we fit uh, a curve to represent different angularity within, uh, within this nomogram. And finally, the MB is also fixed for both uh, post peak strength and also the ultimate residual strength. As you can see, it's a function of that phi B or basic uh, friction angle in the, in the Barton's equation. And, and because uh, this phi B wouldn't change during the course of simulation, this MB parameter is also gonna be constant for both um, Envelopes. So now we can make some uh, simplification assumption to even make this A equation uh, uh, more simple than what it is right now. So first of all, we mentioned that we assume the porosity max to be 40%. So we are going to get rid of that part of the equation. And also, if we assume that during the course of bulking, uh, we form and the, the fragments that interact with each other are having very sharp angular and very rough surfaces, then we can get rid of the this RI parameter and further simplify that A equation to a simple form like this. So as you can see, this 0.67 is the VSI equivalent of this porosity uh, equal 40%. And, and the reason why we replace the porosity with VSI is that we can, VSI is a, is a property that we can use directly with our numerical models. If we use porosity in this equation, we constantly have to convert it to VSI. So for simplicity, we convert that porosity to bulking or volumetric strain increment and set it uh, to a value that corresponds to maximum porosity of 40%. And this VSI, as the zone accumulates VSI, this A changes from 0.6 to 0.85, and it travels from post peak envelope to ultimate strength envelope. And something to notice here is that because we set this maximum porosity to 40%, it means that for a rock mass to reach its com reach completely its uh, true residual strength and land at ultimate strength envelope, it needs to completely bulk to 40%. Now let's see well, what characteristics, given these assumptions that we have made uh, for the MSNA parameters and true fitting the hook brown parameters to Barton's shear strength criteria for rock fill material, what characteristics would it give to our strength envelopes? Sorry. <clears throat> so first and foremost, we can see that a smaller A value for post-peak envelope versus ultimate strength envelope gives it an initial curvature. And that's the beauty of the approach that as we move from uh, peak strength to post peak uh, envelope, first of all, we are, um, uh, our cohesion is going to decrease to a minimal value or zero at post peak envelope. But at the same time, our friction angle is going to mobilize from an initial value to a maximum value here. And then as we move from post peak envelope to ultimate strength envelope, friction angle again is going to reduce to a minimal value that's a function of that basic friction angle. Also, another thing that we have to notice is that because of that initial curvature with lower uh, hook brown A parameter that we give to this uh, post peak envelope, it's bound to cross the ultimate strength envelope at some point. And something to note here again is that in IMAS, we are not allowing for any strength strain hardening to occur. So also when the ultimate strength envelope, which is a frictional only material eventually crosses the peak strength envelope, uh, at this point, this is gonna mark the onset of uh, brittle to ductile transition for IMAS constitutive model. And above this point, it's going to the material is gonna behave in a perfectly plastic uh, manner uh, due to not allowing for the material to strain hard. Okay, now let's talk about the post-peak brittleness. So 
In IMAS, as the material weakens from peak to post peak, we mentioned earlier that it's a function of accumulated plastic shear strain. So uh, IMAS calculates a critical plastic shear strain, or for simplicity, we call it e -crit, And then linearly, as plastic shear strain approaches this value, interplates cohesion and friction angle between these two points. And this critical plastic shear strain is calculated using this empirical relationship that Lurig and Pierce came up with yeah, using some of the calibrated model in house uh, uh, to use in, in careful constitutive model. And as you can see, it honors the GSI and also it has an inverse relationship to the zone size because as we know, as the zone size decreases, it's gonna become more and more brittle so this inverse relationship would account for that. And I have to mention, in a model that you have different zone sizes, uh, these uh, e -crit or critical plastic shear strain would be calculated for each individual zone separately. It's not like the strain softening model that we need to assign a table and, and, and assign that table to a group of zones. Here, each zone behaves independent of each other. And another thing to mention is that, as you remember, I said in KFUF we only had one residual envelope. So this critical plastic shear strain would, in KFUF would control softening of the material from peak to this ultimate strength envelope. So now that we have an intermediate step, uh, this post-peak strength envelope, and it's only this critical plastic shear strain is controlling softening from A to B, not A to C, uh, we need to correct that and basically use a smaller value. So the user can input a multiplier for this critical plastic shear strain that's being used for each zone. And this is something to mention is that this is a calibrated property, this critical plastic strain and critical plastic shear strain. And, and whenever we get a chance to calibrate this property for any project with any data that's available, we will do that. But if you're in a greenfield project without any understanding of rock mass, any, any historical um, evidence of rock mass properties and rock mass behavior, what we tend to go with is a multiplier of 0.5 or something uh, in that order or smaller than that. So now let's see what's the importance of this post-peak brittleness that's represented by e in the model. So let's assume a tunnel of about five meter diameter at a kilometer depth, and let's assume that the vertical stress is a major principal stress for us, and the horizontal stresses have a k naught of about uh, 0.5. So if we don't apply any multiplier to this e -crit and let I mass to define that with multiplier of one, because of the very small zone sizes that we have here, we get a critical plastic shear strain of about 30%. And as we apply multiplier of 0.1 or 0.3 and make the model or zones more brittle, you can see how the zones would shed stresses away faster and the depth of damage would increase from two meters to three and a half meters by making the models, the, the zones about 100, 100 times more brittle. At the same time, because the zones get shed stress faster and, and soften faster, we can see here how it affects the closure in the horizontal direction and vertical direction as we make the model more brittle. Um, at the same point, because the, these more, uh, the, the, the more brittle zones can shed straight faster and reach the post peak strength angle quicker, they, they are able to uh, reach the, the uh, lower cohesion or that minimal cohesion at post peak angle uh, at a faster rate. And also, as you can see here, and also the friction angle would mobilize much faster in the wall of the tunnel. Uh, relatively speaking between these three cases. All right, so now let's talk about softening between post peak envelope and ultimate uh, post peak and ultimate strength envelope between basically points B and C. So the bulking factor or VSI that I was talking about earlier is an integral part of IMAS. It would allow for uh, larger strain processes to control the softening or weakening of the strain dependent properties. For instance, the transition from post peak envelope to ultimate strain envelope that I'm going to talk about right now is controlled by bulking. It also controls the modulus softening, density adjustment, dilation, dilation shutoff, and all of those. So 
I have, I have talked about this ball figure VSI earlier, but this is how it's calculated in the, in the numerical model. It's basically the change in volume over the initial volume of the zone and how it correlates to porosity. So as, as I mentioned earlier, the softening or weakening between B to C, or basically between post peak envelope and ultimate strand envelope are controlled by bulking. Uh, but the residual strand on the residual strand can weaken uh, and strengthen between post peak and ultimate strand envelopes as a function of porosity. And that the reason for that is unlike uh, plastic shear strain that can only monotonically increase. Uh, bulking or VSI can increase as a function of bulking and decrease as a function of recompaction. And this would allow for capturing strength gain in the material due to, due to recompaction between these two thresholds. And for instance, when uh, the stresses are shed back into a bulk, mat bulk part of a rock mass, it would cause some recompaction. And it's just fair to account for this strength gain that, that that, that's accompanied by this recompaction for the material. Let's have a look at an example here. So this is a case of a block and a panel cave mine that at the mine they propagated a west cave to the surface first, and then they propagated an east cave. But due to some difficulties they had uh, around the extraction level, they had to go and construct a recovery, letter, a recovery level. And during this time, they ceased production. And this cessation of, cessation of mining has uh, resulted into recompaction of uh, these caves. But now, to have an understanding of how the new cave from the recovery level is going to propagate upward, it, the mine needed to have an understanding of how the different level of compaction is going to affect the cave performance, the performance of the new cave. So here, I'm showing. Uh, two of the sensitivity analysis that uh, was performed for this mine, one assuming a very highly compacted case that the cave compacted to a really large extent, basically going to 0% porosity, which puts us on the post peak envelope, this blue line here. And another case, which the rock mass is less compacted, uh, and we are assuming a porosity of 70%, uh, corresponding to uh, 0.2 initial VSI, and you can initialize this VSI in the rock mass, and it would put you at that corresponding strength uh, envelope at that point. And both of these cases, as the cave propagates and the material and the material yields, they can soften all the way to this dashed black line, which is the ultimate strength envelope of the rock mass. And here you can see the effect of the assumption for the recompaction in the material. In the case that the rock mass uh, was assumed that the yielded rock or the cave was assumed to be highly compacted uh, for the same period, it, it goes to a shallower depth compared to the lower compacted case that breaks through the surface. And also you can see how the geometry of the cave, how the geometry of the mobilized zones are different between these two cases. Okay, now that we talked about the rock mass strength loss and also the brittleness, the post peak brittleness, let's talk about tension weakening in IMS. The mechanism of uh, independent tensile softening is implemented in IMS in addition to softening tension and cohesion at the same rate based on plastic shear strain. So, what does that mean is that as the zone accumulates plastic shear strain, it would move, it starts uh, shrinking and moving towards the post peak envelope. And with this, uh, the tensile strength of the rock mass would also decrease to a minimal value of zero eventually when we, when we are at the post peak envelope. But in IMS, uh, it's similar to some of other uh, process constitutive models is that you can independently allow for a perfectly brittle behavior intention that if a zone crosses the peak strength envelope in the tension side, it would suddenly loses all its tensile strength and snap back to this uh, vertical line while maintaining its shear strength. Um, otherwise, if we didn't have this brittle, uh, brittle uh, behavior, if a zone crosses the peak strength envelope in the tension side, it had to sit there until it moves to the shear side of the uh, strength envelope and accumulate plastic shear strain and then degrade this tensile strength with that. But this independent uh, accounting for tension weakening would also allow us 
to define a table if if we think this perfectly brittle behavior intention is not really realistic for a rock mass, we can assign a table to the zone that controls this weakening of tensile strength with accumulation of uh, plastic tensile strength strain. So it wouldn't really sit there forever as long as it's riding along this uh, peak strength on the tension side. And as it accumulates plastic tensile strain, it starts degrading to a zero value. In terms of modulus softening, the rock mass Young's modulus in I mass is the initial rock mass Young's modulus is estimated using the intact Young modulus and consideration for GSI using the hook dietrich equation as, as shown here. But a critical component of strain softening model is to account for this modulus softening as the rock mass falls. And we are using the Pappas and Mark approach where if they showed that the modulus of the rock mass drops in a non-linear fashion as the rock mass, uh, as a function of fragment shape uh, and intact strength as the rock mass box. You can see initially it drops very quickly and then it reaches a plateau. In I mass, the modulus is updated constantly every step uh, using the zone-based uh, volumetric strength increment. And this would allow for both modulus softening during bulking and also modulus hardening during recompaction. As I mentioned, the VSI can increase or decrease. So it would account for uh, it would account for modulus hardening when, when the stresses are shed back into bulk region uh, and induced recompaction. This is an example of mm -hmm. the ratio of bulk modulus to in-situ modulus that's implemented in IMAS, and it shows how it would change as a function of intact UCS and, and the cave rock bulking factor. You can see as the bulking increases initially, it drops up pretty quickly and then it slows, the rate of modulus reduction uh, slows down. So this is an example of a pit slope. Basically, we are having a section here, we are looking at the depth, and then this is a wedge of the pit slope showing here. Uh, anything that's colored is uh, simulated using eye mass, and anything that's gray here at depth are either elastic or on the surface are waste material represented by more cooler material. So we feed to the model the intact uh, rock Young's modulus and also GSI, and then eye mass be at the first uh, step, it would calculate the rock mass modulus for us as shown here based on these two input parameters. But in this example, I'm showing how the modulus softens in, in, in IMS. So here we are looking at the propagating cave. These are the, these are the cave panels, different panels, and different colors and the black solid lines around them show different lithologies that initially, because of having different GSI and different intact rock material, uh, they had different initial uh, rock mass modules. But you can see as the cave propagates to the surface and basically the material inside the cave become part of the mud pile and bulk, uh, the modulus uh, drops from that initial value. But another interesting factor is that you can see that we have different, uh, in different ultimate modules within the, within the cave. And that's because for, for different purposes, you can define different maximum uh, bulking factor cutoffs for your rock mass. For instance, in this case, because we had preconditioning of the rock mass uh, immediately above these uh, footprints, we and we wanted for the cave to propagate upward quickly, we uh, limited how much the rock mass can bulk. Versus here, we didn't limit that and we allowed it to bulk up to around 40% porosity. And that, hence, you can see the difference in how much the rock mass can bulk to and how much the rock mass can soften. To. All right, so now let's talk about the dilational behavior. Within I mass, the dilation angle is set as a standard material property, and it drops to zero when the zone reaches its user-defined maximum bulking factor. And by default, this maximum bulking factor is that 0.67, where that corresponds to 40% 40, 40 porosity. This would prevent zones from expanding to an unrealistic level. And a constant dilation angle can be assigned uh, if, you have the, if you have it from your rock mass characterization or if you can get it from the literature. By default, the dilation angle is assumed to be 10 degrees in I mass. But alternatively, a more advanced dilation model is available in, in, in I mass 
that constantly updates the dilation angle for each zone as a function of porosity and also confinement. And we basically put this uh, dilation model together uh, as, a, as a piecewise function. So between 15% porosity to 40% porosity, the dilation angle is directly taken from the dilative part of uh, friction angle from Barton shear strength criteria for Rockville material. At 0% porosity, we took the dilation angles from uh, back analysis of some of the uh, bonded block models that we have run in different rock masses. And then we use a, uh, functions that quickly decay with porosity between 0% and 15% to connect these two pieces together. And the reason that we had to put uh, this dilation model together is that you can't really find that many dilation models out there that account for these large porosities and large uh, accumulation of strain uh, as as the rock mass deforms when they predict the dilation angle. And, and this model is, is currently being tested and validated by, by Itasca, and, and we are expecting some fine tuning to happen to it in the near future as well. Another very important and useful and powerful feature of uh, IMAS is the S loss, uh, basically a short for strength loss. And it's an indicator for damage in IMAS. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> this parameter can combine multiple uh, phenomena that occurs to rock mass in, in one number. So how it changes is that how it's defined is that between peak and post-peak envelope, it's defined as one minus the ratio of plastic shear strain uh, to critical plastic shear strain. And between post-peak to ultimate strength envelope, it changes as a ratio of volumetric strain to maximum allowable volumetric, volumetric strain. So in simple forms, between in, in elastic condition or at peak, we start with S loss of one, it would reduce to a value of zero at post-peak, and then it changes from zero to minus one as the rock mass fully bulks to that user-defined cutoff bulking that, that the user specifies. So what it shows us in one number is that as we move from peak to post-peak and it changes from one to zero, the cohesion would reduce us from its maximum value to a zero uh, or minimal value. The friction angle would mobilize us at, um, at post-peak envelope at S loss of zero, while bulk is still zero. And as we move from post-peak to ultimate strength, this uh, S loss changes from zero to minus one. Cohesion would remain zero. Friction angle reduces to a residual value and bulking maximizes. Now let's see how we can use this S loss. So in the simplest form, these are two galleries uh, from underground mine that are explicitly simulated. And you are looking at the contour of S loss and it shows us where we can uh, highly anticipate damage uh, relative to the rest, of the, the rest of the galleries. And another thing that we can grasp from this S loss is that, okay, we are looking at a contour between one to 0.5. So it means that we are not fully at the post-peak envelope. So we still have some cohesion left in the rock mass. And also uh, the, the friction angle is not completely mobilized uh, in these areas um, because they still haven't made it to the post-peak envelope. We also could use S loss to calibrate our model. This is a, this is a an example of a mine that they are using, sorry, that they are using uh, sub-level caving in combination with mm -hmm. stopping in some parts of the mine. Uh, so in this, on, on the left-hand side, they have the sub-level caving and they have stopping on the right-hand side. Anything that's gray is backfilled uh, material. The brown show, the brown color shows the uh, mobilized zone and the transparent gray shows the fracture zone surrounding the underground excavation. So what happened here is was that they had a series of stops that because it lost its back to another uh, series of stops below hand, it lost confinement and started caving upward. And um, there are some observations in terms of damages er er around the existing underground infrastructure, some of the, some of the, at some levels, for instance, there are some damage seen on this level, some damage seen here, and lack of or no damage or fracturing in most of the level up here. So 
Uh, although we are not explicitly simulating all these underground developments for uh, computational efficiency, we can paint the contour of S loss on these on the wireframe of these developments and tweak the rock mass properties uh, as well as the critical plastic shear strain that I told you is a calibrated property until we observe damage uh, on these drives that that they have at, at the mine they have also observed damage for calibration of the model. But something that's important is that, okay, we are observing damage here and here that they have observed damage along those drives at the mine, but it's also important not to predict any damage where they didn't have any uh, indication of damage or fracturing at the mine as well. So this is another look at this, um, another view of the, uh, the strokes that are caving. This is the, from the backside. You can see there was some damage seen on site at this drift. And, and, and the model was calibrated until uh, we could simulate some S loss of near zero, which is basically loss of full loss of cohesion at the same point in the model. But now this S loss can be used in a predictive way. For instance, as the cave propagates here or uh, moving upward, you can see how it influences the serviceability and stability of, of these drives, because at the moment you are still using this uh, during production and they want to know when they're going to lose these um, underground infrastructure. So this is this is how SLOS can help uh, with that prediction, but also another powerful feature of IMAS here with this SLOS is that it can provide an indication where would be the sweet spot to for the mine to install their monitoring equipment, their, their, um, their, their uh, yeah, like their, their instrumentation, uh, because you can not to put all your eggs in the in the models basket, but also have a first-hand uh, information from the rock mass behavior at critical points that we think they're going to become unserviceable in the near future. Okay, this is another example of a block and panel cave that the cave is propagating. So this green uh, isosurface that we see, a uh, transparent isosurface, uh, delineates the extension of the fracture limit for this cave. And again, here we are not explicitly simulating the underground infrastructure, but uh, we just paint uh, some of the damage classes that we define based on different thresholds of S loss. So for some of these uh, drives or underground drifts, we had information from the mind that they observed damage. And if it needed rehab work or it didn't need a rehab work or if it was unserviceable. So based on that, they could define some S loss thresholds that would define different classes of damage. For instance, in this case, class one tells us that, okay, we are expecting damage to occur around this underground excavation, around this drift or around this shaft, but it is going to be serviceable without any rehab work. In the class two damage, the, the, some rehab work is going to be needed uh, to keep it open, uh, but uh, it's still going to be serviceable. And in class three, that uh, underground opening is not is going to become part of the cave, for instance, and it's not going to be serviceable um, in the future. And as you can see, how these damaged classes would evolve as the cave propagates um, uh, wider. And this is a powerful tool for the geotech management team. To, to allocate their resources and their uh, attention to different parts of the mine that needs more attention. They can, they can predict where do they need to allocate the resources and their attention as the care propagates. This is another case of using S-loss in a, in a pit slope. So basically it shows the rock mass degradation behind the slope. I don't know if you can see anything that's orange on this cross section have completely lost uh, its strength up to the point of reaching peak strength, uh, post-peak strength envelope. Basically, it has lost its cohesion and it's a frictional only material. And if we combine this with some instigators for slope failure, we can see some instability. Uh, this, this was the cross section that we were looking at. And these are the contour of velocity that shows some part of the slope that could become unstable. And as we saw, this part of the slope was completely degraded into a frictional only material with mobilized friction angle. But if you remove the toe of this upper slope uh, due to, for instance, here we are, these are the, the, the black zones are the material that have yielded 
under ubiquitous joint and the solid line show the orientation of ubiquitous joint. So this material, if they fill along the UVs, basically representing some sort of circular rock mass failure or toppling behavior, it takes the toe away uh, from under toes, this upper part of the slope and provide a pathway for, for that upper part to start show, uh, to become prone to instabilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are some other important components in IMAS that I'm not going to go into details of those. Um, I encourage you to look at the IMAS documentation that's part of the Flag 3D and 3D uh, manual, and it's very detailed, and it even has more details that I'm covering in here. So go through that and you would uh, learn more about IMAS. But some of the other important components that I just want to mention here is the density adjustment based on zone-based volumetric strength. And, and because most of the time we run our simulations in small strain rather than large strain, we need to account for this density adjustment. And we do that using the volumetric strain increment. As we saw in the previous example, we can define weakness planes within the impact matrix using the ubiquitous joints. You have the option between one or two residual envelopes. If you want, you can turn off the second residual envelope and define your own uh, post-peak envelope. And also you have the option of tracking the stresses at failure. Basically when a zone for the first time hits the peak strength envelope, it would keep track of at what stress it, it yielded initially and what was the rotation of the stress tensor. <clears throat> Finally, IMAS uses the latest Itasca consultative model framework and techniques for apex correction, automatic testing, and property update and management. <clears throat> and this might sound like a simple thing, but these apex correction and accounting for details, especially when the zone uh, constantly crosses between shear to tension or when the major principal stresses intersect, that's where most of the yielding and the progressive damage happens to the rock. And it's really important to account for those details at the apices correctly uh, to have a re reliable estimate of, estimate of rock mass damage and also accumulation of plastic shear strength. In terms of installation and usage, IMAS is built into flag 3D and 3D7. And to invoke the model, you basically, apart from uh, you need to uh, just mention config IMAS and assign the constitutive model. And as, apart from the density, you only need five um, initial parameters for IMAS to kick in all the default behaviors. And those properties are GSI, intact UCS, MI value, and intact modulus for the rock. And also we have this multiplier for the ECRIT that I mentioned. And the reason that we put it here, we could have put a default value of 0.5 or 1, but the reason that we implemented it here is that we want to, uh, to encourage the user to think about this value uh, when, when doing the simulation and, and to account for how important this, this parameter is. So as I mentioned, these are a list of properties that comes with IMAS, but these are the initial parameters that you need. And then you can, as, as you make your model more complex or you need to add more features, then you can start playing with these different parameters. So, the, the parameters are broken down into four categories. The flags and inputs are basically the properties that the user would specify. The calculated properties are those initial properties that IMAS would calculate from the initial inputs that the user uh, specifies. And also emergent properties are those strain dependent properties that evolve during the course of simulation as a function of uh, plastic shear strain and, and volumetric strain increment and the user can uh, constantly monitor those to, to look at this, uh, the state of the model. And again, they can be broken down to properties that, that um, uh, correspond to peak strength or modulus or strength softening or bulking and dilation and softening or stress of failure, that was, that's what I was talking about, or invoking ubiquitous joints in the model. In terms of research and improvement, I think you have, uh, uh, put it together by now that IMAS is a constitutive model based on empirical relationships and its formulation is ever evolving with the state of the art uh, knowledge of strength and post peak behavior of the greater rock masses. And the current focus on refinement of the IMAS behavior is focusing on a more robust criteria for estimation of the critical plastic shear strain to provide some guidelines for the users. 
characterization of the upper and lower bound for the equivalent roughness, as you remember, we extrapolated that R parameter to 0% porosity. And we are doing some bonded block model analysis to further refine what uh, that R value could be if it's any different than what we are using in the, in the constitutive model right now. And also refine the dilation model consistent with this uh, upper and lower bound R because they are tightly <clears throat> related to each other. And finally, uh, IMAS has been developed uh, to represent the rock mass response to stress changes using strain dependent properties that are adjusted to reflect the impacts of dilation and bulking as a rock mass undergoes plastic deformation and accumulate, accumulates uh, uh, volumetric strain increment or bulking. <clears throat> the two mode softening in IMAS allows for mobilization of a high apparent friction angle at low confinement when the fragments are full in the rock mass. And this is followed by reduction in friction angle as the rock mass falls. And this would allow for a very rich and realistic simulation of rock mass post peak behavior. And finally, IMAS and its predecessor, KFOC, have been developed and refined over the past decade, been mining the applications being their core purpose. And they have been used successfully by Itasca on numerous operations and, and projects. And with that, I'd like to uh, uh, open the session for any questions and answers. And, I, and I'm sorry if I went a couple of minutes uh, over the time that was specified initially. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Dugagne, and I'm going to be uh, reading out the questions uh, for a song to answer. And we do have a number of questions. Um, one quick note, um, just wanted to remind everybody that um, IMAS is built into FLAC 3D and 3DX7, um, but that it's also sold separately. So it, it's, uh, it's an add-on. So on to questions. Um, Asan, uh, yes. is it correct that VSI controls the nonlinearity of the strength envelope? and that the A parameter fits the peak, post-peak, or ultimate envelope? Can, so GSI doesn't, uh, GSI is only used for calculation of the peak strength, and it doesn't control any part of the post-peak or the residual or the ultimate strength envelope. They are all controlled by the intact rock strength and the, um, and the Barton shear strength criteria for rock field. But, we are fitting some hook brown parameters to that um, shear strength criteria, but the, the residual envelopes, the nonlinear part, is not controlled by GSI. It's only, it's affecting, so in, indirectly, GSI can affect the calculation of cr uh, critical plastic shear strain. That's the only contribution it has to the, to the post peak envelope. What was the second part of what was the second part of the question? Um, does the A parameter fit the peak, post peak, or an ultimate envelope? So the uh, hook ground A parameter. So it's, I, I I didn't understand the question. What if, if the A parameter what? Does it fit the uh, peak, post peak, or ultimate envelopes? A parameter. So the A parameter, I, I, I don't understand the question, but so the A parameter for the peak strength envelope is calculated from the GSI or the user can specify that, but the A parameters for the ultimate, for the residual strength envelopes, basically the post peak envelope and an ultimate residual strength envelope are calculated and they change between 0 0.6 to 0.85. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Is the modulus softening only implemented for post-peak behavior? The modulus softening is, the, the modulus softens as soon as we uh, accumulate any volumetric strain increment, but the accumulation of VSI before post-peak envelope is very, very negligible. It happens, but it's very small. It's mostly happened after the post-peak envelope. Okay. Are properties internally scaled with the zone size, or is it necessary to assign different sets of parameters depending on the zone size? No, the proper, the main property that that needs to be a scale based on the zone size is the critical plastic shear strain, and that's that is a scale based on zone sizes. Yeah. 
is it possible to initialize displacements within calculation phase without losing the accumulated uh, VSI? Uh, you can't, uh, if, if, you assign, if you assign a displacement to the model, it is going to accumulate some VSI, but we have some built-in properties, like um, I can go back here, uh, like this target VSI, input bulking target VSI, that can correct uh, uh, what VSI is initialized in the model, even after uh, you, you input some displacements to the model. Okay. Does IMAS change or degrade the rock modulus as the material deforms after peak strength? Is, can you repeat that again, please? Mm -hmm. Does IMAS change or degrade the rock modulus as the material deforms after peak strength? Yeah, I guess we answered, we answered this question earlier. It, it does uh, at the function of VSI, but the VSI that's being accumulated in the zone between peak strength to post-peak strength envelope are very uh, minimal. So it doesn't make a meaningful difference in terms of modulus. It, the accumulation of VSI mostly happen after the post-peak strength envelope. Okay. Um... Was the model used in a case history study to confirm its effectiveness? Yeah, this is this, yeah, this is our go-to constitutive model for all uh, mining projects or operations, and and some of the models that I showed you are calibrated to observations at the field. Yeah. Okay. Um, how does the speed of IMAS compare to the SUBI model? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, it changes re relatively with different versions, and I. But I think right now it's. I. Joe might be able to answer that better, but I think it's faster than SUBI model right now. I I think these two models are now quite a different speed. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, I gather that the dilation angle model you presented only applies from post peak to residual based on porosity. Am I correct that you assume dilation from peak to post peak is negligible and therefore use a dilation angle of zero degrees for this portion of the stress strain curve? No, so between, so again, that dilation angle is a function of VSI, and the VSI doesn't really, it, the change in VSI between peak strength to post peak strength is very minimal. But between the peak to post peak, it's going to be the maximum value of dilation angle that we had. So it's not zero. Uh, let me show you. It's, it's um, that maximum value. I, there you go. Oops, too much. There you go. So uh, between peak to post peak is going to be somewhere in the in 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 this range, basically near zero percent porosity. Great. Is compaction when it occurs confinement dependent? Yes. Okay. Does IMAF take into account that the same rock mass? under high confinement stress, far from the cave, behaves perfectly plastic? It really depends on, on the stress state. If, uh, if, if it's not really yielding, the perfectly plastic doesn't really apply to it. If it's sitting somewhere in an elastic region, probably you have to see at what point it's going to, at what confinement it's going to uh, intersect the peak strength envelope. And I'm assuming it's going to be below the Britain to ductile transition. So I think in most of the cases, it's going to be uh, non ductile. All right. Is there a preferred element size when using IMAS? It, it, it really depends on, on, on your modeling, but I, it, it really depends on the application, the extent of the model. But 
I know there is no preferred zone size as long we would like it to be as close as possible in size, but um, it's it's not a possibility in most of the mining applications. So no, there is no preferred zone size per se. Is there a calibration made? Sorry. Is there a calibration made for the response of the volumetric strain to assess the perturbance of the rock mass? Yeah, let me, so is there a calibration made for the response of the volumetric strain to assess per, um, No, so that, that part is controlled, like it depends what you are talking about. If you are talking about the modular softening or the strength uh, degradation, uh, there are some there are some uh, parameters that you can play with, like the uh, in terms of modular softening, you can't really change anything unless you play with the maximum cutoff for bulking and also what the initial intact modulus is. In terms of strength, what you can play with is the basic friction angle, and that's uh, what you have control with um, to to change how high or low the the residual envelopes would sit. How does IMAPS behave for rock with low GSI versus high GSI? Um, so you can, first of all, when you, when you use this uh, model, you have to be sure that the strength softening concept would apply to them, as, as you can tell from the name. Um, I think they are as efficient, the, the, the constitutive model works uh, equally as good for both cases, but sometimes something that we need to consider is that sometimes the GSI doesn't apply to some of the rock masses when they are high, very highly massive or veined, um, or, or depending on the scale, maybe GSI doesn't apply to them. So you need to consider that when you input some of the parameters, maybe instead of putting a GSI, you need to put in your own calibrator or characterize uh, hook round properties or you need to adjust for the uh, rock block strength or the intact strength that you put into the model to be in agreement for those hook round parameters that you put in there. So it's all about what properties you put in there. Okay. Um, there's a question about the cost of IMAS, and for that I would just direct uh, users to go to our website, um, ataskacg.com. And under software, um, there will be a button for requesting software quotes, um, and then you'll be able to um, uh, find that information for your particular case, depending on what else you're buying, licenses, that sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you showed how the brittle ductile transition can be captured by the strength envelope formulation. Have you confirmed that if you use a GSI of 100 and you CS an MI, Represented of a crystalline silicate rock, you get a reasonable brittle ductile trans sorry, transition, i.e., in agreement with Mogi's line. Yeah, so if re if you can you can uh, if if you set those um, basically the anchor points into the constitutive model, then you can play with that basic friction angle, and you definitely can get uh, basically the Brittle to ductile transition in line with, with what Mogi would suggest. Yeah. Are there plans to include the intermediary, sorry, intermediate principal stress S2 in the constitutive models at so, this at some sorry, point? Before you, before you go, like it's gonna be within the range of what Mogi suggests around like, yeah, it's gonna be within the same ballpark. Yeah. Sorry, can, can you go to the next question? Yes. So are there plans to include the intermediary principal stress S2 in the constitutive models at some point? Perhaps a more general FLAC 3D question. Um, there are no plans uh, for IMAS, but for, for FLAC 3D, I, I refer to Joe if, if he is uh, thinking of something for other constitutive models. Uh, no, not in the very near future, but in the long term, no, if we are confident about any update, you know, with with intermediate principal stress that could be built, we may be update MS. So that's my answer. Thanks, John. 
Is attention cut off for perfectly brittle behavior similar to the old school method of just using a fish function to assign zero strength or stiffness to a zone that has failed in tension? Uh, i.e., is IMAS formulation just more efficient at doing this? Yeah, so it's it's basically the uh, the old. I think I think it's. I don't know what that old school method is, but I assume that what they mean is implemented in a more Coulomb or strain softening model. It's 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 the similar behavior. Yeah, like as soon as it fails in tension, it's going to go to zero. But you also have the option of assigning that table, as I mentioned, that that it would soften the tens or weaken the tensile strength as a function of accumulated plastic uh, tensile strength. Yeah, we have a flag in the in the property. If the if the brittle flag is on, it will be perfectly brittle in some you know preferably to zero. But if it's off, we have several just to use on say we have a table, we have uh, decrease, you know gradually you know from the peak to the post peak yeah yeah you can assign a table if i can find it here table tension and and again i need to mention that these are at zone level each zone has its own individual set of properties okay um I'm a little uncertain to this question. Um, what is the relation for um, conf dependency of compaction? So we would allow, yeah, the confinement dependency for compaction. We would allow for FlagKD to handle that by itself. So basically, the compaction is a function of VSI, and the VSI would decrease as the confinement increases in a yielded part of the as, as the stresses are shed back into a yielded part of the model. And, and we would just allow for flag 3D to handle the VSI based on that confinement. And the, that, that VSI would determine uh, what uh, the, the, the other properties that are depending on the VSI. But in terms of details of formulation of that, I don't know, Joe, like, is there a detailed formulation in terms of flag 3D or? No, no. Yeah, we just we just allow for for flag three. If you don't have any spe special relationship for that, we we allow for flag three D to directly estimate the aside from that uh, new stress state as it gets confined, and then uh, we continue updating the SI based on that. Okay, just a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, are there? Do you have any comments for APEC management? rule or priority, please. Uh, for example, in area with interface elements or area with complex geological features, um, assuming that the features are modeled as regular zones with zone-specific control parameters. Uh, that's a question for Joe. Uh, so a peg, a management, uh, because for the, this, because for the conventional molecular model, we have a apex, so the stress corrected should not, you know, beyond that apex. So that this is very important for numerical stability. I'm not quite understand the second about some interface element. So maybe I can answer this later. Yeah, but I'm not quite understand what that question is. Okay, thanks, Joe. We'll follow up uh, with the the person who asked the question. Uh, next question, potentially, what complications are we adding to the problem by using ubiquitous joints in this constitutive model? Uh, first of all, we are not adding uh, ubiquitous joints. So we're in the new formulation of uh, metastatic constitutive models, we use this hierarchy system. And Joe can, can expand it if, uh, if, it, if I don't explain it well. So basically what we do is that if the user wants to use ubiquitous joint, we borrow the ubiquitous joint logic internally from the ubiquitous joint constitutive model. And I know that there are some people who are not really uh, excited about ubiquitous joint, but we think as long as you 
uh, use ubiquitous join within the constraint, for instance, having like three or four or four or five zone thickness with ubiquitous join, or if you align the orientation of your zones with respect to the orientation of your ubiquitous join, they should be they should be behaving fine. There might be some interlocking issues, but in most of the cases, at least I personally have never had uh, that 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 issue. As long as you use it, knowing that when you use ubiquitous join, you need to have some special considerations for it in your model. I, I think it's it's fine. Okay. Um, have you tried to extend IMAS for dynamic loading? Uh, we have talked about it, but it's not really on top of our priorities because uh, for some uh, blast simulations, it would be nice to have that dynamic option, but it, it's not in the in our list of to-do things, at least at this point. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions. Is the is IMAS only applied for shallow depths like mining applications? Can it be applied for higher depths with larger confinement? Have you had any experience with this? Yeah, no, it could be applied to any, as as long as the, the strain softening applies, you can use it for any of them. Actually, one the, the cave that I was showing you, the block cave, uh, that uh, the, the one that I was defining damage classes, those are at about uh, 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,400 meters depth. So yeah, you can use definitely use it for shallow depths. Sorry, the, the, at, at uh, considerable depth. Okay. Um, how, has, how does IMAS handle the high slope angle of the tangent to the hook bound curve when going from peak to post peak? Um, so we, uh, first of all, I guess Joe can comment on that as well. We put a cap on what the maximum friction angle can be. And also we had to introduce a very, very tiny negligible amount of uh, S parameter for the post peak envelope so that you don't interpolate between zero and zero when you go from post peak to ultimate strength envelope. Yeah, we have a we have an upper limit angle, uh, not 90 degree because less numerical instability. I think I think in the implementation we have a upper limit of 70 degree and then do other things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to model structural driven failure in Black 3D, do you have any recommendations for IMAS properties to capture that behavior? It's really uh, project driven, but what uh, at least like in the past few projects that I've been involved with, it, 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 it again really depends on the characteristics of your structure and and and, and it's really uh, specific to the site, but um, for simplicity and also we think it's it's more justified to use to represent some of these structures as as, as weak zones within the numerical model. And if you don't have a rock mass characterization specifically done for your fault material or structures, we tend to correlate it to the host rock, basically penalizing that part of the uh, rock mass with some lower GSI value or somehow correlate the properties to the host rock that is better characterized. But again, it's really project specific. Okay. How do runtimes of IMAS models compare with more traditional models like the strain softening model? Um, because of the large number, I, I haven't really Done, uh, we, we, it, done the test recently, but I, I, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe Jason would have been a good person to answer this, but I assume compared to strain softening or hook brown, I think because of the large number of parameters that IMAS has, probably it's around 75%, I'd say, of the speed of other constitutive models. I, that, 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 that's my guess. I haven't really done a, a comparative speed test recently. Does UB joint remain in the model when string exceeds the post-peak curve towards the ultimate state? 
Yeah, the the UVs would the UVs would stay, but probably due to the nature of how the 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 stresses would change around the zones when it yields, probably it's not going to kick in, and it's going to be mostly the yielding is going to be driven by the weakening of the intact zone itself, not the UV. But it would stay there, yeah. Uh, and this last question, um, in modulus reduction, how is the model preventing the bulk modulus from increasing to unrealistic values or from Poisson's ratio exceeding 0 0.5? So we have a, first, there are like two things. First of all, uh, you can, as a user, if you don't want it to go to a really uh, low values, uh, you can have a maximum bulking cutoff uh, that you can control. But also from the implementation point of view, there are, there are caps for all of these. And in IMAS, I believe there is a cap of 100 MPA for the lowest limit that the modulus can solve. Okay, great. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Asan, for your presentation and Joe for helping uh, to answer some questions. And um, thank you everybody for attending and for your questions. So this will conclude the webinar. Um, a video will be posted on our website and YouTube channel um, and uh, everyone who's registered uh, will be notified where you can find that. Thank you everybody and have a good day. Thank you everyone.